Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us at this amazing event. My name is uh, Leon Lukianitz from Synergetica Group. Uh, we are very proud to sponsor this particular panel. I have a lot of interesting friends uh, who kept asking me why we are doing this, why we're sponsoring this. A bunch of my friends are women, and I find uh, most of them were quite cynical and skeptical about such events. There is a, I'm surprised at how many people believe that uh, the job of equality is already done, uh, there's nothing else to do, the doors are already open. I have a very simple perspective on that. I'm a proud father of two young daughters. My daughters are five and two. And uh, I'm observing my five-year-old and seeing what she does. And as every five-year-old, she likes to play with princesses. She's into Disney. Uh, getting her to play with robots, with technology, with engineering is not a very easy job, as it might seem. The fact that the doors are open, in my mind, is, is not enough. Uh, uh, the doors are open indeed, but we need to make sure it is uh, exciting to go through those doors. It is, it is interesting to go through those doors. We need to ensure that the stigma of going through those doors is removed. So to me, this job is not done for, for another few decades, for a generation, until my grandparents stop snickering and, 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 and cringing at suggestions that going to technology is okay to girls until the Disney changes their tunes and changes their movies and cartoons. So to me, this is a very, very long journey, and I'm very proud to sponsor this on an ongoing basis. With that, I'm gonna uh, open the floor to Serena Tehani from Cyborg, who will introduce our amazing panel, and thank you again. Thank the audience for coming to this conference and for supporting us um, and coming to see this panel. I have the honor and a pleasure to announce the following panelists. Gaylene Gray. Gaylene is the Assistant Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at McMaster University. Sherry Monroe. Uh, Sherry is the Assistant Vice President of Access Governance at Manulife. Allison Atkins. Allison is the director of the Cybersecurity Risk Management Program at Scotiabank. Welcome, uh, Allison. And uh, Debbie. Uh, Debbie is the associate vice president of authentication governance at TD Group Bank. And June. Hello. Um, <laughs> <laughs> June leads the identity and access management program at Moneris. Uh, my name is Serena Tehani. I am going to be your moderator today. Uh, just so you know, it's my first time moderating, so uh, I hope I'll get better over time. <laughs> Great. Um, today, our topic is uh, diversity. Um, diversity is prevalent in the cybersecurity workforce. Like, according to the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, diversity is Canada's strength. Canada is known as a multicultural nation, and it celebrates its historically diverse population. However, like, you know, many people still face negative experiences, unfair compensation, and exclusions in the workplace due to their distinct backgrounds. So diversity is made up of individuals who have an array of identities, abilities, backgrounds, cultures, skills, perspectives, and experiences. Our topic today, uh, like I mentioned, is developing diverse, innovative teams. I've been in sales, um, IT sales, for about 20 years now, and I believe that diversity is very, like it's a relevant topic in my world at CyberArk. Uh, we're a global company with offices around the globe, um, and on a daily basis, I find myself like you now talking to partners, outsourcers, vendors, customers, um, and they're located all over the world. Uh, many times I find myself working late nights or early mornings, even sometimes Sundays, uh, just to collaborate with research and development that's around the world, like ours at CyberArk is in Israel. So working for a global organization has a lot of opportunities as well as a lot of complexities. Um, 
We're so fortunate today to have an exceptional list of panelists that have a wealth of experience in def different sectors. Uh, some sectors are being education uh, with McMaster, um, we've got insurance with Manulife and banking. Our first question to the panel is, what does diversity mean to you? And how has diversity played a role in your career? Okay, great, and I think I get to start. So yeah. uh, thank you, I, I wanna thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm really pleased we had a really nice lunch together earlier, so uh, there was no, I don't think there was any chicken, so we're good. Uh, <laughs> so diversity, it, it's a, a common word that's used. We have um, an individual in our organization, I have a counterpart whose focus on our campus is equity, inclusion, and diversity. Uh, and certainly in higher education, it's a critical area that we're focused on all the time. For myself, um, you know, I started uh, back in 1999 in T at a, a higher education institution. I think my microphone's going on and off, so bear with me. Uh, I have no control over that. Um, I have a pretty loud projecting voice, it should be good. Uh, I started back in 99, and without realizing it at the time, I was breaking ground for other women in higher ed IT. When I joined the University of Guelph at that time, I was the only female systems analyst and worked at the University of Guelph for many, many years and uh, became a manager, first female manager, became a director, first female director, became a deputy CIO, first female uh, deputy CIO, and then moved to McMaster to become their first CIO, essentially, VP and CTO. Um, and so, you know, it's a really interesting thing in higher education when you work your way through the organization. We work in an area of academia, obviously. Uh, we have very diverse groups of people who come through our organizations as our constituents. So uh, students, we're going to have up to 25% international students within the next, hopefully, year. It's our target. Um, we have academics from all over the world. Uh, so our environments are very diverse, but our IT areas haven't always kept up with what the, our constituency base looks like. So it's really critical for us to be focused in that area and to try to ensure that we're encouraging people to join our teams uh, who are able to really understand the experiences of the people we serve on our campuses um, because IT really is a service organization and in the higher education um, environment. We're there to help other people do the wonderful and amazing things that they do. So for me, diversity is about that diversity of experience and education and the ability to really see things from different perspectives. Um, and in my world, my background actually you know, is English literature. Uh, is my undergraduate degree, I have an MBA. Um, and I kind of fell in accidentally into IT. And I think it's a really important message and I've heard some other people talk about that. You know, we have some pretty antiquated ideas and even in the job descriptions that we've created within higher education for IT positions, computer uh, science degree, you're always looking for something in that STEM area, which is fantastic. But when I actually have conversations with a lot of uh, leaders in IT, and especially female leaders in IT, a lot of us didn't come out of an IT background. We bring other skills and capabilities into the environment, and I think it's really important for us to remember that while we're nurturing and mentoring other people who maybe don't have some of those um, STEM backgrounds, but definitely bring creativity and other, um, other skills to, f to the fore. So um, diversity to me is everybody can come to the party. We all have a, a role to play, and it's really important to have that around the table when you're looking at your team. Thank you. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, sort of how my experience with diversity is. I also started in the 1990s, um, and I started in data networking. And I walked into my first Cisco training class and the instructor said, you must be Sherry Monroe. And I said, I must be the only female <laughs> in this class. <laughs> and I was. I was on a team of all men and in an industry that was predominantly male. And for the next 10 years, I would be the only female on that team and one of few women at industry events. Uh, I can say that I never experienced any bias uh, as a woman on the team. They all treated me with respect. and In fact, I was treated as one of the boys. The only time they took advantage of it was when they always sent me under the raised pole to trace a cable because I was the tiniest one <laughs> that was there. Um, but fast forward now to today, and I, my team is more than 55% female. Um, 
But I still think there's a, a little bit of a di diversity issue the higher up the ranks you go. So mm -hmm. I've been in the industry for more than 25 years, and I think that I have reported to a woman for less than one year of that. So um, I think that we still have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. um, although the industry is changing, I think there's still more that we can do to, uh, to improve that situation at a, at a senior level. So uh, in terms of what diversity means to me, I think Shailene touched upon it, but it's really uh, perspective. So we need different people from different backgrounds with different sets of experience to bring alternative perspectives. We don't want to um, you know, be trying to solve the problem with only one frame of mind, right? We, we need to turn the box upside down and look at it uh, from the back and, and think differently. Um, and that, that really enriches the, um, you know, the capabilities that we bring to the workforce. Um, what I would say in terms of my experience and how it's shaped my, my career, um, I'll speak a little bit about being a foreigner. So sure, I've been a female um, in the technology space since the get-go, but I've also um, felt, like a, felt like a foreigner. Uh, I moved to Scotland back in the, um, so it was 2007. Um, and for the first time, I, you know, I didn't speak the native language. So uh, <laughs> it was very difficult to understand um, the Scottish uh, accents, the, the <laughs> lingo. And I, you know, I actually, there were times that I felt as though I had, I was an alien stepping out of a spaceship. Like I, I would open my mouth to speak and everyone would look at me. Um, and I would say things and phrase them incorrectly or I'd spell words the American way. Um, so that, I think, opened my eyes to what it feels like to be a newcomer in an environment and, and a, you know, a different side of the diversity coin. So, you know, there's lots of us that, that may feel like minorities in our, in our workplace and we can be allies for each other and bond together. And I think appreciating the differences that each other bring and some of the challenges, the inherent challenges that we have um, and feeling like an outsider as well and being empathetic to that is, um, it's a lot, that's a lot we can offer. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Diversity to me is, is a little bit about how you get to an outcome, right? So we protect a very diverse um, group of, of customers and clients and, and part of that is, you know, you need that diversity of thought to come up with the best um, outcomes. And that comes from a bunch of different ways, right? Culturally different, you know, gender difference, different experience. And I think uh, you really get a more fulsome um, product, right, at the end of the day. It's similar to, from a personal experience, very similar to Sherry. Um, I started in the sec ops side in early 2000s and often went into a room and they'd say, you must be Debbie. I'm like, yeah, I'm the only woman. <laughs> and that persisted. I, I never really felt that I was disadvantaged. It was just, you know, you kind of blend in with everybody else and, and I was treated with respect always. Um, but, uh, and I don't think I've ever worked for a woman, as you were saying that. So I think it, things have come a long way since I started in this space to now. Certainly we wouldn't have had anything like the forum we're at today, um, but we absolutely have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Excellent, so diversity to me is, uh, you know, everything that what everyone has said, but also I think it has changed since I was in this industry, became in this industry in the past 15 years. And um, I think it has a lot to do with our Canadian immigration policy. Uh, we have raised the bar, that, like Canada is a great country, a lot of people, you know, one of the desired countries to live in. So therefore, we have a huge pool of talent that want to move to Canada. And the bar of coming in for a skilled worker is raising every year. So we're actually getting the cream of the crop all over the world um, to come to Canada. And recently, when I'm looking to hire, people have been here for... Two, two, two weeks, as little as two mm -hmm. weeks, they brought their small, you know, young family or themselves. They're so brave. I'm like, what? You just left? Like, what, what do you have? Two suitcases? And that's what they do. And they're so agile. They live in Airbnb here. Oh, okay, you know, my, my, I'm going to find a job here. Well, I'm going to find another uh, co uh, place here. So I think that's actually helped us um, get people with cybersecurity, actually, experience um, to Canada. Yeah. And for myself, you know, I'm Chinese, I'm a woman, woman and uh, I... I don't really feel um, uh, being like different because I think it's just we're all is a great country that we have the 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 um, patience for each other and uh, and be here to make a, our new home. So, mm -hmm. thanks. Um, so, June, what do you think needs to be done to get more diversity into the cybersecurity industry? 
So, um, you know, I think the first thing is the pipeline. So we, we, don't, we have um, all these universities, so maybe Gaylene can talk about, but I don't know, and I think that is a great place for talent, for diversity, because it's built in, it's already there, everyone is there. So if we can get courses, introduce kids, students, to cybersecurity, because I don't know how you got into your field, because I just stumbled upon it, you know, from IT to identity and access management. But recently, when I was uh, interviewing a, a co-op in U of T, for, and these kids are from um, uh, computer science or engineering. I was so surprised they do not have a cybersecurity 101. Like no one knows about cyber cybersecurity. So I think that's where we can definitely partner and introduce them so that they know that it's not just ransomware, it's not just hacking, it's not just you know SOC. There's actually other fields within disciplines within cybersecurity that, that we're in that is actually really cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gary, do you want to chat? Yeah, I think, you know, to your point, uh, Jin, there are a number of institutions now that are focusing uh, in cybersecurity. So there's certainly opportunities for people to actually take that as a discipline because I think um, it'd be interesting if we could do a poll in the room how many people actually went to school for cybersecurity or how many of you have just transitioned yourself into that because there's a need and or demand. Um, so education is a big part of it. I think the reality for a lot of us, especially when you heard earlier today, people were talking about um, the fact that we really are going to be missing out on um, enough people to fill the spaces that there will need to be if they're not already to fill. I think we really need to look uh, to the left and look to the right and find some people who we think we can mentor and nurture into those uh, opportunities. So I have one of my team members here, Marissa, and uh, she came out of client services and is the, the female on the team. We have a very small IT um, team, IT security team within my, um, my organization. And she's being mentored by her boss, who's a male. And, um, you know, we really need to look for people who show curiosity and creativity. That was also talked about earlier. Uh, and we have to think differently about where we're going to find folks to come in and do this kind of work. I think it, it does take people who have curiosity and, and creative creativity and people who are coming from a lot of different backgrounds. So um, mentorship and coaching, the last panel talked about that quite a bit. I think that's a really critical piece. Um, we, have, we have to convince maybe ourselves, but certainly the, the individuals who report to us that they have all the potential and we have to make those opportunities available to them. We have to open the door for them. And when we're in leadership positions as we are, I think that the best way to get people uh, into this area is to invite them in, frankly. Um, I just posted for a director of information security and I had one, I'm not joking you, out of over 100 applicants, I had one woman. Uh, that's awful. We're a great place to work. Uh, so, you know, something isn't working yet. It's back to how do we, how do we present the positions as an example, but um, how do we help to encourage and where are we going to find people to fill some of those positions, especially as you get into more advanced positions. I think it, it, we really need to start people in, um, at, at uh, more entry level and nurture them and grow them within our organizations. Allison, what are you seeing? Yeah, I think, so the pipeline, absolutely critical. I think the other thing we can do as organizations that are, you know, recruiting and sourcing talent is, you know, try to try to entice people in. Like, we have to advertise our roles. Like, we're selling the opportunity to the workforce. So make it interesting. People want opportunities that they can go into and, and learn. They want to develop. Like, let's not sell the notion of this being some kind of exclusive club that, um, you know, that newcomers aren't welcome to. I think we, we want to demonstrate that we want, um, you know, smart people that are willing to learn that have adaptable, um, transferable skills. And, you know, the, some of the, some of the, the aspects of, of cybersecurity or even our industry specific aspects like banking, that stuff can be learned in a very short time. So, you know, when mm -hmm. you're conducting those interviews, don't you know, try to stay away from the kind of the textbook memorization stuff and look for people who uh, can demonstrate using using judgment and, um, you know, adapting to change in, in the workspace. So I think it is, it's upon the, uh, the organizations with our recruitment process to sell an opportunity and make people know that, you know, we, we will value what they bring. Um, yeah, I think that's it. That's okay. pretty good. Um, 
Sherry, um, I know like you work for uh, Manulife and uh, there's many offices all over the globe. How do you go about building out and integrating your teams? Mm -hmm. Well, so I am, um, as, as to what you guys have said around um, looking in different areas, I, when I applied for that job in data networking, I did not have any of the technical skills that were listed in the job description. Mm -hmm. So I, I start with trying to make sure that the job description focuses less on the specific technical skills and more on the other skills that are necessary for the role. And when I'm looking at candidates, I'm looking at candidates with a wide range of experiences that, that can be applied to the role. Um, we have the benefit of having a remote workforce, so I can hire from anywhere. And I have resources in North America and in Asia and all over. Um, and one of the benefits I find when doing that hiring is that um, I can't do in-person interviews. It do, it's the possibility doesn't yeah. even exist. And so much of the communication that we do is over the phone anyway. Um, I, I don't even do video interviews. I don't want to know, I don't want to know what the person looks like. I don't care if they're tall or short or skinny or fat or what color their skin is or I don't, I don't want to know any of that because it doesn't really matter. So I only do phone interviews and I look for, um, I'm more interested their experience, their skill sets, their interests, and how they would fit on our team. And so, I, I mean, I'm very proud that we have a team, a, we have a very diverse team in terms of gender, race, religion, and thought. And mm -hmm. I can tell you that the best ideas for my teams have come from differing opinions and sometimes arguments around what should be done. And I don't think that we would be nearly as successful if we were all the same. Yeah, I totally agree. I know um, we met a couple years ago at a conference, and you ha you were actually looking for one of your colleagues that works for you. Because uh, you never, met, never met them. Right, yeah. so I remember that. I was like, I'm like how is that I possible? hired them, but just hadn't met them. <laughs> um, Debbie, like, how do you go about uh, building out and integrating your team? And, like, and when you're hiring, like, how do you take an unbiased view? Um, so there's a couple of things. When, when I'm looking to hire, I often look at capabilities versus experience, right? Mm -hmm. So um, similar to, to Gaylene, like I'm, I'm not a technologist by trade. You know, I, I got back into sort of the risk side um, because mm -hmm. I, was, I happened to be part of the technology team in a finance role. And I used to be an auditor, a financial auditor. And there was a very strong need to have somebody who could translate for audit and sort of you know manage the audit, audit group. And so I ended up back sort of in the technology side on the risk management side. And what it underscored for me is the transferability of your skills, are, it's unbelievable, really, right? So I really look for capabilities. And things like the ability to influence and really clean you know, messaging is really important in our space, right? So that weighs pretty heavily. Um, in terms of, you know, once you find those candidates, ensuring that you've got a diverse panel of people that are meeting with them and interviewing them, I think, is very important, too. Um, and it helps to keep the, those biases in check. Um, and June, what, uh, what considerations do you take when you're hiring? So uh, recently, I actually hired a few um, folks for my team. Yeah. And I actually look for people that are different from me, other than, you know, the skill that they need and experience. But because if you have everyone that's the same as you, then, then you know, uh, they don't really give the different perspective that you're looking for. So I purposely look for someone that's different and so that they can complement the team. And I can attest to that. <laughs> Everyone on your team is very different. <laughs> um, uh, Gailene, do you want to, uh, what do you see in the industry? Because it's a different education thing. Yeah, the, it is really different. So, I, I mean, I touched on that a little bit earlier. I think that we're, we're looking for people who, First of all, want to want to work for us. I mean, I will be really honest. It's quite interesting. The you know higher education is public sector. So um, when people come to work in our world, you're coming there for um, some very different reasons sometimes than you might be uh, going to other sectors or, or areas of work. So yes, I'm talking about money. Uh, it's a little bit different, but there you know there's so much opportunity and so much creativity that you can bring to work, and we have such a great um, we have such a great campus environment, you know, you're dealing with students. So there's so many interesting ways that you can um, engage students in the work that we do uh, so that they get an opportunity to see what it looks like to work at an institution, not just to attend the institution. So, you know, I think there's, um, 
there's lots of great things that everybody else talked about here and I mentioned earlier as well in, in terms of the ways in which we try to recruit people um, but it's it's hard and we, you know we're competing in a catchment here in the GTHA which is um, it's big but it's very competitive and there are some really great you know look at these nice people they're very great people here to work for so uh, it's very competitive environment so you have to try and you know I think that's casting that wider net you've got to try and people who resonate with whatever it is that you um, offer in terms of your institution or organization, and, and they're all different. Very cool. Um, okay, according to the World Economic Forum of 2020, um, it stated that 18% of women hold top level manager positions and only 36% were holding senior roles in comparison to men. Other statistics that we also heard today were that um, for every dollar a man makes, um, a woman on average makes 74 cents. And uh, we also heard that 20% of the cybersecurity workforce are women. What do you think in particular can help fill that gap for women in cybersecurity? Since we're at a women's cybersecurity <laughs> conference today. <laughs> um, June, do you want to start off? Sure. So, um, I think uh, the first thing is, you know, you got to get, when, once you are given the opportunity, then uh, we got to leverage th the skill that we have. So a lot of women in general, we have, you know, we're better communicator, we like to talk to people, because most of the men that I work with, they really want to hide behind their computer, they don't, when they have a problem, they go and, you know, try to solve it themselves online, but they don't really go to talk to people. So I think take advantage of the fact that, because, you know, for me, my team can attest to it, when I have an issue, like, let's go, let's go go to a room and then go figure it out, and, uh, and, and sometimes it's like a lot faster in coming to the solution, however, there are times that as you talk, you you know you open different cans of worms. But then it's up to me to figure out where the scope is and what I'm going to solve today, not tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sherry, how do you think uh, women can fill that gap? Yeah, and I'd like to think that we're looking to see how women can add value, and not that we've run out of qualified men. I mean, it's always <laughs> funny that we phrase it that yeah, way. Yeah, how can they add value? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. um, and I think that anybody to have different life experiences is going to mm -hmm. have different perspectives and I think that women are such. I think that we also need to remember that a large number of cybersecurity roles are, require more interpersonal skills than technical skills. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that they require, you know, analytical skills and communication and teamwork and leadership. And I think that women, it, and I'm not, I don't want to, you know, stereotype everybody into one panel or the other, but I think that women are much more, um, they, they go out of their way to seek and understand other people's pers uh, perspectives and they tend to be a little bit more creative. So um, I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of space for difference, diversity across the board. And I think that the more, the, the bigger the variety of people and experiences that you have in your organization, the more successful you'll be. And I think, uh, part of, if yeah, I, may, um, I think part of that too is, um, I think cybersecurity's got a bit of a branding issue, if you want to call it that, right? So people think about cybersecurity, they think very hardcore technical. They think, you know, very um, sort of, you know, hoodie in front of your PC. Red team. Sort of, yeah, red <laughs> teaming, right? And it is way beyond that mm. in terms of the capability. So I think part of it is a branding issue, yeah. right? How do, we in, how do we get that scope of skills well communicated so people understand the breadth of roles and capabilities that you need, right? Yeah. Yep. I want to leave some time for questions, so I'm going to ask um, maybe like a, just a closing question to the panel um, and give everyone a chance to answer that. And then if the audience can get their questions ready, we'll hopefully give you at least five minutes for questions. Uh, so in closing remarks, uh, what would you like to leave the audience uh, if there's one piece of advice that they can take home? Can I? Yeah. yeah so absolutely. thank you. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's really interesting, and this is a, a women in cybersecurity uh, conference, obviously there, we're leaning in that space, but IT generally, you know, a lot of people move into cybersecurity from, from IT experiences as well. And um, I think all of us have an opportunity 
whether we're, so in my particular role, I, um, I would say that yes, information security is my responsibility on our campus. Um, however, what I spend most of my time doing is talking to people and, and um, uh, helping them to understand what we do uh, and how we do it within the organization. The, the critical piece that I think we have, especially for those of us who have moved into leadership positions, is to uh, really take on mentoring coaching roles and to really be generous. Um, you know, I think uh, we, we are in a competitive world and it's hard in some uh, cases to, to stop trying to push your own um, self forward because we're all trying to move ahead and do the things that we want to do, but bring everybody with you. I, I really try to focus on that with my management team as they're uh, supporting their staff to really think about what they can do to uh, ensure and improve that their uh, journey and their opportunities and to be generous in those opportunities. So if you have the opportunity to send people for training and to, um, to, to connect them with other people who maybe are doing things that they're interested in. So um, for me, if I have people who are in IT, how do I get them exposed to people who are, who are in niche or, or more specific areas like cybersecurity? So I think all of us, and, and by the way, never too soon. Um, or, and never too late for that matter. You know, at any stage in your uh, career, you have an opportunity to um, mentor, be a peer mentor with other people and encourage um, the people around you to achieve their goals and you will get so much more back uh, than you give out, I guarantee it. So, you know, for me it's about generosity and really trying to ensure that you're instilling that in people around you. Thank you. Um, I would say don't wait till you have 100% of the qualifications and, and don't be afraid to take a chance. I would not be here today if I didn't have the courage or the naivety, I'm not sure, to, to go for something that on paper was out of my reach, you know, it should have been out of my reach. And I would say if there's something that you're interested in, talk to somebody who's in that area and see what skills you already have that could be applied to that mm -hmm. or what, you know, what you might need to do or learn to, um, to be able to move into that kind of a position. And, I mean, just take charge of your own direction. Yeah, I agree Very with that. Good. Yeah, I think you guys covered it quite well, but I, again, I would say, you know, don't let fear stop you, and don't let fear stop you getting into cybersecurity, if that's what you want to do, or furthering your career. Don't, don't let fear stop you in life, you know, bringing, bringing your gifts and sharing your talents to, to you know, contribute, right? Um, and, and the other key point is, you know, women need to support women, so let's, you know, let's all move forward together and let's build some critical mass, right? Yeah. I, th I think you've covered it well. I think it's be, be bold and be creative, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. continue to learn all, every day. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll open up for questions. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, say a little, a few words on that. I mean, I think it's kind of about um, developing, you know, empathy, like trying to, um, you know, understand the other person's perspective that they're bringing to the table through listening and try to put yourself in their shoes. So how, you know, what does the world look like from their eyes? You know, what are their objectives? And often in the workplace where there's conflict, it's not that you know, someone's good and someone's evil, or so, you know, somebody wants to do good for the organization and somebody wants to do bad. Usually, you know, we're all trying to do the best thing uh, in our roles, but sometimes those objectives, there can be some friction. But, I, you know, I think it's, it's about really trying to um, empathize with, with the other person's, you know, position and, you know, what are they trying to achieve? How are they looking at the world? And, and when, when you can bring that into the conversation, the, conversation can change and the conflict goes away and there can be that compromise. 
Yeah, uh, if I can, so I, I think one of the things that's really important, and I think this is, it behooves us as leaders to really focus on the culture of our workplaces. And, um, you know, you're going to, to your point, and the other, I have a, a really interesting um, uh, added component of that, which is really large stretch and age di differential. So generational <laughs> uh, swing. We have people who stay on, on our campuses for over 30 years, and other people who come in right after being a student. I think you need to really provide opportunities for people to, there are, there's training, there's, you know, diversity thinking training that you can um, expose people to, setting up values for your team. That whole culture piece, um, for some, you know, it, it seems like a big time investment. It's a really critical piece. You give people vernacular and, and a lexicon in which they can come together and have conversations that maybe would be more challenging if they didn't have it. So I think you have to invest some time into that component of team building in order to ensure that you're getting, you know, what's best about people. We have a diversity and equity team or committee that comes together and we, you know, that group has really taken on a life of its own and I think it's been really beneficial for the organization because it helps people to really be proud of where they come from, what their background is, and to really feel like they're able to share that with people. So it's just one example, but culture is huge. And so for myself recently, I just, if I may, it's just, yeah. um, you know, team building built on that is food. People yes. love food. Yes, yes. So <laughs> anytime you have potluck, yes. you know, you can bring a potluck. It doesn't cost anything, right? <laughs> Everyone brings like their own food or they, have, they can't make it, That's they can right. bring drinks. And then people can just talk over food. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. We can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, not from a distance. Yeah. Yeah. I know we're running out of time. Um, uh, there was I one over there, Serena. Yeah, yeah. One more. Yeah. Oh. yeah, she's from Spain. Great question. Uh, I, and I think <laughs> part question. of that has to go to the job description so that you can make the job description, like I said, less technical and more about the underlying skills that are required for the job so that those people who do have comparable skills can at least, they can get the matches on the whatever algorithms the HR folks are using. Mm -hmm. There, there's an app for that. We were just, uh, I was at a training session. And <laughs> I know that sounds of course crazy, there is something that you can, you know, put your resume through uh, um, an evaluation um, software and it'll tell you all the things that you're doing that's actually exclusionary to other people. So, it, I mean, people, people are working out problems this way and I think it's important. I'm fortunate because we have a little bit of autonomy. We fall under, a, uh, obviously, an institutional HR department, but I do have a bit of autonomy on how I go about my hiring and I'm... I'm pretty, uh, pretty passionate about hiring. That's, I think, uh, it's the biggest job we all do. You know, when you move into leadership, the most important thing you do is bring really great people onto your team. Great. Well, I want to thank the panelists. Uh, I want to encourage you to ask more questions. Uh, we will be outside. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, great thank job. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Great job.